How's everyone doing? I'm surprised that the room is still occupied at one of the last talks. Thank you for sticking around, and uh, I hope you are enjoying the week. So let's get started. Is the recording on? Okay. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Yuan, and I'm a principal engineer at Red Hat. And I just joined Red Hat at about three months ago. And I'm also a, a project lead uh, for Argo and Kubeflow. T and today I'm going to talk about production-ready AI platform on Kubernetes. So today's agenda, uh, first I'll be talking about the AI landscape and ecosystem. And I'll be talking about some of the elements to consider for production readiness when you are building, building an AI platform on Kubernetes. Keep in mind that this won't be an exhaustive list as there are obviously many other things to consider in production, especially when dealing with Kubernetes and cloud native technologies. And at the very last end, I'll be talking about uh, a reference platform using some of the tech stacks uh, that um, and uh, for different components. Uh, so I'd like to spend a few moments to introduce my book that's recently released uh, this year called Distributed Machine Learning Patterns. So it will talk about different patterns that's involved when building a large scale distributed machine learning system. And uh, at the very last section of the book, it will also uh, talk about a reference implementation uh, that provides an opportunity for readers to build a, uh, a real-life production-level machine learning system uh, hands-on. And take a moment to scan the QR code if you're interested in learning more about the book. OK, let's dive into the content. So uh, the AI landscape and ecosystem is getting larger and la larger, uh, especially since the uh, the birth of the large language models and GPT type of models. Before that, it may be known as statistics, data science, or machine learning, deep learning. Now, the, uh, all the words are getting blurry and blurry. And they are, um, here are the two uh, land, uh, screenshots. One is from the Linux Foundation AI and Data. Uh, uh, the second one is from CNCF. It has a larger scope, but it also contains categories for machine learning and AI. Definitely check out the links uh, for this two landscape if you want to learn more about it. And if you ever missed uh, Priyanka's opening keynote, she also mentioned uh, she also has a nice uh, picture of the landscape uh, for AI-related projects in the ecosystem. Yeah, definitely worth checking out. And here are just some example projects that are used very frequently when building a cloud-native AI platform. For example, Kubeflow, Argo, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, KServe, Volcano, Ray, um, and so on. And this is a diagram created by the Cloud Native AI Working Group uh, that's started recently. And this diagram describes the relationships between different roles, for example, data scientists and, and engineers, to uh, uh, be between those roles and different components in the infrastructure. Uh, for example, data scientists, they may focus on building predictive or, or generative models. For example, predictive models in, make maybe like classification models and, and uh, clustering problems. And generative models are the recently hot ones. For example, the large language models and large vision models and so on. And then hardware architect at the bottom, they may focus on accelerating uh, the uh, machine learning workloads using different hardwares. And there are also different engineers in between, uh, even like data engineers and platform engineers. They often need to collaborate a lot on really building a platform that's user friendly and uh, in the meantime, production ready. So check out the the diagram and the white paper released by the Cloud Native AI uh, Working Group, if you want to know more about um, the details. Here's a QR code to scan if you want to join uh, one of the community meetings. And uh, I believe in the community meetings, there are also notes, uh, link, uh, links 
uh, to the reference uh, 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 the, the white paper as well. So uh, there is also a, a dynamic or difficulty between uh, difference between how much the data scientists care and how much the infrastructure is needed. Um, for example, data scientists care most about the model, uh, but it's actually one of the easiest part to handle in the infrastructure side. So definitely check out uh, one of uh, the talk I gave with Savin last year uh, at KubeCon North America. Uh, if you want to know more about the challenges uh, we faced and as well as the solutions uh, we uh, suggested. The first perspective I want to talk about is um, the scalability uh, for the production readiness. Uh, one, there are different uh, scalability challenges. One of the uh, is horizontal scaling. Basically, you add more parts to, you distribute all the, uh, the work, heavy workloads into more and more parts through horizontal scaling. So Kubernetes provides its own horizontal part autoscaler. Uh, if based on uh, like, uh, utilization metrics, right? And Knative also provides uh, autoscaler uh, that are based on more through like event-driven, uh, request-driven approach. And besides horizontal scaling, there's also vertical scaling, basically adding more resources to existing parts instead of adding uh, more and more parts that may uh, bring the whole cluster down. And Kubernetes provides a uh, vertical part autoscaler, and there's also a resizer that helps you adjust resources based on the cl cluster nodes. And besides scaling based on parts, um, the cluster also needs to be um, scalable. So in order to that, there are different approaches to scale the cluster. So one approach is the cluster autoscaler that automatically adjusts the size of the uh, Kubernetes cluster. And another thing to think about is the algorithm scalability. So certain algorithm may not be suitable for, uh, for large scale, right? They may be suitable for batch, uh, and some algorithm uh, have to be modified to be uh, online friendly. Uh, they, have, they are uh, relevant uh, online modified version of those algorithms in order to use them in production. So really depending on your uh, re business requirements, whether you want to uh, run all the workloads through batch fashion or streaming fashion. Um, and next uh, are the hardware acceleration and resource sharing between different hardware accelerators. And uh, uh, these are getting very popular, especially in uh, this week's KubeCon. The, uh, you may see a lot of talks related to resource sharing between multiple GPUs and so on. So it's definitely work, worth checking out those relevant talks. Uh, I believe there are a ton of them already this week. And also for batch scheduling, of course, those are also hot topics. Uh, you may find a lot of uh, talks in the Cloud Native AI Day as well uh, that happened on the first day of the week. The next perspective I want to talk about uh, is the reliability. So one thing is the high availability and disaster recovery. So if you are building a Kubernetes controller, you definitely want to uh, support leader election, right? Having multiple parts stand by to make sure if one, one of the part failed, you, are, uh, you also have other part uh, to be ready, taking the tasks uh, instead of waiting a long time to start uh, another part. And elasticity and fault tolerance are also important, especially for uh, training workloads where if one of the workers fail, you don't want to stop it uh, from training, but rather using, uh, rather uh, continue training um, from the checkpoint if needed. And also if you're running, uh, if you have less uh, resources, you, you may want to start your tr uh, distributed training as soon as there are parts available and then other parts will join when the tr once the training starts. And in order to re increase re reliability, one thing to worth mentioning is the versioning and, and following the GitOps principles to make sure everything uh, you deploy in, pr in production are uh, being version controlled in Git. 
so that whenever something happens, uh, things can be recovered as desired. Um, and you might want to prevent vendor locking. And something to consider is to use a hybrid cloud. So to make sure you don't get locked in uh, through, uh, uh, by a single cloud vendor. And when bad things happen to a particular vendor, it's easy to switch to another one, so uh, reliably. And support and SLAs are also something to consider, especially if you are building a large platform that consists of multiple, many different uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, tech stacks, technologies. Uh, so you may want to make sure like each of those components are being supported uh, well enough by your engineers or third party service provider. And observability is a hard thing uh, in, uh, in the cloud native uh, Kubernetes world. Um, so it, here, the observability, I'm talking about both observability from system perspective and from statistical per perspective, especially when you are building machine learning models, right? You want to look at, uh, take a look at the performance metrics uh, based on statistics. For example, when you are tuning hyperparameters for a model, and you, you want to make sure those metrics are available to track, uh, to understand whether your experiments improve or not. And there are operational metrics that you want to take a look as well, uh, like, uh, from system perspective or resources perspective, or like um, if you want to understand more about what your controller is doing and what bottlenecks your controllers are, are having, those are some of the good uh, metrics to look into. And uh, the next item is the, uh, the model explainability and visualization. So oftentimes, when you are building a very large and complex model, you want to understand uh, how well this, uh, this model performs. Right? You want to understand how trustworthy the, the model is making its decisions. So you want to know what the model is actually doing, and you want to visualize uh, what some of the layers are behaving in the models, and whether the model can be trusted uh, in, in uh, industries like banking and, and uh, insurance uh, and so on. So those are uh, some things to consider as well. Uh, for pipeline tracing, here I'm more talking about if you're running a lot of experiments, you may want to uh, make sure each uh, step in your experiment are, are being traced uh, uh, properly. So you want to understand what data set is being used by what model and where the model is being deployed. And, uh, how the model is changing over time and and the relationship in uh, the relationship between the data set and the models basically the the lineage between uh, those uh, different objects used in your uh, machine learning experiments and the last one in uh, observability I want to talk about is audit log uh, so if you are working with large data science teams you may want to understand who's doing what uh, in the cluster who's using this data, who's building this model, and how are they uh, collaborating each other? Are there things you can improve uh, through the collaboration process? And I'd like to also talk about the flexibility. Uh, this is one of the measures we definitely want to look into when you consider something uh, is production ready. So when usually when you build machine learning models, right, it involves a lot of different machine learning frameworks. For example, PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, Xubus, and so on. You want to make sure your um, tech stack is well supported for different frameworks depending on your data scientists, uh, data science teams' uh, particular needs. Uh, so, and uh, you may want to um, also uh, look into different language-specific SDKs to make sure your team meet their requirements as well. Um, and standardized APIs are also important, especially when you are working with different frameworks. Uh, you, for example, you want to make sure your serving uh, inference platform supports a standardized uh, uh, protocol across different frameworks so that it will be relatively stable and relatively easy to onboard new frameworks. 
And the data size, um, uh, the data set uh, is also one thing to, uh, to think about. Um, is the data set large or small? Is it streaming data or batch uh, data? So based on the characteristics of the data set, you may want to use different uh, uh, technologies. Uh, same, similar thing for model, right? Depending on the size and the framework uh, you use to train your model, and you might want to select tools accordingly. And different models produced by different uh, frameworks also have different performance, and you may want to look into different model serving runtimes to make sure the runtime is performant for your particular, uh, uh, for, for the models you've trained. Uh, and it's also challenging sometimes to integrate with different hardware uh, accelerators to, so you want to make sure your data science teams are, have a friendly interface to build models easily, leveraging different hardware accelerators. So for example, they may not need uh, heavy uh, GPUs for uh, data processing, or maybe they, they need that. Uh, for model training, you may want to consider applying uh, GPUs and for serving, uh, vice versa. Um, so, and for uh, the, and also like whether you are building the platform for cloud or on-prem or on edge, that's also something to consider as well. So instead of building uh, one platform for each, you want to build one unified platform that works on different environments. And you want to pr uh, uh, prevent from being vendor locked in as well. So before I dive into the, the reference implementation, I'd like to introduce Kubeflow. So Kubeflow is the machine learning toolkit uh, for Kubernetes. It consists of different tools for uh, uh, that are applicable for different parts of the machine learning lifecycle. For example, um, there are uh, Kubeflow notebooks that's uh, that's useful for experimenting, um, uh, especially for day-to-day -day, uh, uh, data scientists' day-to-day -day work, and training operator for distributed model training, and Kubeflow pipelines for getting all the steps together in production, uh, and CUTIP for model tuning, and there's also a central dashboard uh, for uh, user access control and uh, visualizing your experiments. And K-Survey is a uh, now a separate project, but it was originally born at Kubeflow and, and uh, successfully graduated as a separate project uh, that's dedicated for model serving. And Kubeflow works across different uh, machine learning frameworks, uh, such as TensorFlow and PyTorch. So for data processing, um, um, so the, uh, there are many frameworks to be, that can be used for data processing depending on your data set. So here I want to focus on uh, the use case where your data set is extremely large. So one, uh, I, I want to mention uh, that uh, Apache Spark because uh, it supports both batch and streaming and it also works with time series uh, very well. Um, so we, I'd like to also welcome um, Spark operator to be officially part of the Kubeflow project. Uh, so now it's under uh, the Kubeflow or GitHub organization. Uh, so uh, it's, as you can see from the right hand side, it's pretty easy uh, to deploy uh, your Spark application. So it, uh, you basically specify a Python file that uh, includes the logics for your, uh, if it's data processing, uh, then it's uh, simply a Python profile, uh, Python file that you can include this in this YAML, and then specify the computational resources uh, in this YAML. And if you are working with a lot of data intensive applications, one thing to consider is to use the Fluid project. What this project provides is it enables data set warm up and acceleration for data intensive applications. If you have multiple data set and if they are large and if they are in different resources, uh, Fluid will leverage the distributed caching in Kubernetes to speed things up. 
And there's also data set abstractions for different uh, heterogeneous data source management. You, uh, depend, uh, so if you have multiple data sources from different providers, this will be a good way to connect them together. And uh, it also provides the data aware scheduling. So when it schedules the jobs between, uh, it will understand how much uh, the, the usage of your data set. Uh, data source and in order to uh, speed things up in this process. Next, I'd like to talk about the distributed model training. So for those of you who are not familiar with distribu distributed model training, um, one example here is that if you, uh, for, uh, so this example is using the um, uh, collective communication pattern, right? If you have a large data set, you uh, and you can partition them into different parts and having multiple worker nodes to consume those individual data partitions uh, independently and then um, uh, aggregate them together and to update the model using the, com uh, the calculated gradients uh, on different workers. Uh, so Kubeflow's training operator uh, works with multiple uh, uh, machine learning frameworks, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, it provides Python SDKs as well as APIs uh, uh, that you can use uh, to submit your distributed model training jobs. So uh, it supports multiple framework. For example, there's PyTorch job that supports the, the PyTorch distributed training. And also it supports multiple different uh, different uh, distributed training strategies. For example, using or uh, all reduce uh, uh, multi-worker training strategy or parameter server-based uh, training strategy. And there's also MPI uh, job that's suitable for high-performance computing. And it integrates well with the job scheduling frameworks such as Q and Volcano. And one th last thing that's worth mentioning is the elastic training. So it supports well the elastic training uh, mechanism. So if one of the workers fail, it knows how to start a new worker and continue from there. Of course, that also depends on uh, whether the machine learning framework that you are using supports elastic training. So here's an architecture diagram for distributed uh, training uh, with workflow. Um, so basically, if you have a TensorFlow training code in Python, you can submit uh, a job pretty easily just by configuring the resources and the distributed training strategy you want to use. And then training the operator will set the environment variables for you and starts the workers and parameters based on the uh, the strategy you specify in the, uh, the, the, the YAML spec. And here's an example by Andre uh, for uh, if you're working with large model uh, fine tuning, uh, here is a simple Python API you can use to fine tune your model uh, in a distributed fashion. So here, for example, you have a, a, a hugging face uh, model uh, and you want to uh, use some additional data set uh, and then uh, use tuning some uh, adding additional parameters and some configuration for your LoRa uh, and then specify your computational resources. So in, uh, this is pretty uh, easy to use uh, as well. So next is the model tuning. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, CUTIP is uh, the tool inside Kubeflow that supports hyperparameter tuning. Uh, it supports paradigms such as NAS for uh, neural architecture search and early stopping. And it's agnostic to, to different machine learning frameworks and languages. And it's pretty deployable uh, anywhere uh, as is Kubernetes native. And it works well with other uh, Kubeflow components as well. Uh, here's the CUTIP uh, uh, architecture. So basically, it, uh, when uh, users, uh, so basically the controller uh, creates the, ex, uh, reconciles the experiment. And each experiment uh, does some trials. Uh, and then those trials, uh, the metrics from those trials will get collected 
from the metrics collector. And then there is suggestion controller that's responsible for just suggesting uh, the, the, uh, the best parameters and based on the algorithm you specify for the hyperparameter hyper tuning. Yeah, if you want to learn more about the architecture, there is a reference paper uh, linked in the slide. Here's an example how, of how you are using Kartip to tune your uh, uh, machine learning model. So on the right hand side, the, this is the trial template, basically the specification for you to describe how to train a single model uh, with a particular set of uh, parameters. And on the left hand side, um, you are uh, specify the, the hyperparameter tuning uh, algorithm as well as its objective and search space and how much you wanna go uh, for to, to tune your, uh, exp uh, your model. Uh, so you may specify different uh, number of uh, trials, maximum number of trials uh, and so on. Here's a screenshot of uh, the Cartip UI. So you can track uh, how well your model is, uh, your model performed during the experiments. And uh, you'll see here, it has uh, training accuracy, validation accuracy, and, and these are the uh, parameters it tried to search uh, within. Uh, yeah, so it's very easy to use uh, experiment experiment tracking tool. And the next step, uh, once you trained your model um, uh, after uh, parameter tuning and so on, the next part is gonna be the model serving, right? So KServe is a platform that's uh, highly scalable and standardized um, on Kubernetes. It's performant and has a uh, standardized protocol across different frameworks. And uh, it uh, supports serverless workloads and, uh, and supports event-based auto-scaling based on Knative. And uh, it, uh, there's also a sub-project called Model Mesh that's also highly scalable and uh, based on uh, dense, density packing and in intelligent routing. And there are also ways you can uh, uh, pre-process or post-process uh, your uh, before it, the model actually gets served uh, by KSERV. And there's also advanced deployment strategies uh, like narrow rollout and pipeline. And you can also create ensembles of your inference graph uh, as well. Here's a diagram for the single model serving. So basically KSERV controller creates uh, runtime deployments for each individual model. Um, Based on uh, whether you are using Knative or not, it may use Knative part auto scaler or use the horizontal part scaler uh, from Kubernetes. And it creates a trans uh, transformer service if you also include pre-processing or post-processing steps. Uh, also creates the predictor service, which is also responsible for processing your inference request for either predictive models or generative models. And the model mesh project uh, uh, is very uh, user friendly, uh, very useful for uh, for high scale, high density, and, and frequently changing models. Uh, it intelligently loads and unloads models from memory uh, based on um, the responsiveness to users and the computational uh, footprint. So it knows how to group, um, uh, there is uh, basically a routing layer, so it knows how to intelligently route between uh, model serving requests uh, and to the, um, to the, uh, the model uh, runtime parts uh, uh, at the right time and at the right location. Here's an example uh, if you are serving a large uh, model. Um, so here uh, on the right hand side, you can easily deploy your hugging face uh, Llama 2 model using this YAML uh, spec to create an inference service. And once this is created, uh, you can easily, uh, uh, if, you've, uh, if you already put forward it, your service uh, locally, you can uh, easily um, send the inference request. For example, here we are asking, what, uh, where, uh, where is the Eiffel Tower? And it tells me the location 
uh, of the uh, Eiffel Tower uh, based on uh, the model. And one problem I want to mention is uh, the usually uh, when, especially when deal with, dealing with large models, uh, the model initialization takes a long time, and uh, there is a, sp a sp special feature called model cars. Um, that's, that utilizes uh, the models that's stored in the USCI image um, to significantly reduce the startup time and, and especially when if one part goes down, it doesn't take another uh, like significant kind of amount of time to start a new part and uh, start serving the large model. Uh, it also has a lot of other advantages as well. Uh, and you can also leverage techniques such as prefetching images and laser loading and so on in, to significantly improve the efficiency. I'd also, uh, so the next step, uh, once you have all the models and everything, uh, you wanna often want to uh, uh, con construct a workflow that, so that you can easily reproduce the experiment in the future. So Argo Workflows is a container-native workflow engine for Kubernetes. It, um, here we are uh, focusing on the machine learning use case, but it's also generic uh, 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 workflow scheduling framework. You can use it for other cases as well. And it includes CRDs and controllers and multiple interfaces from uh, through command line or server or different language SDKs. And it also provides a UI as well. Here's an example YAML uh, where you are constructing a, a basic DAG shaped workflow, uh, for example, from A to B and then uh, see the you can basically construct a diamond shaped workflow uh, 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 from Python. So you can also that in YAML as well. But here we are using Python as a simplified example. And Argo Events is another project inside Argo that supports event driven workflow. Uh, it supports different uh, uh, event sources, different triggers, and it's also you can construct very uh, from simple to complex uh, event uh, workflow. Um, so here's a reference architecture of the entire workflow. Let's say if you want this to be event-based, you may trigger things. Uh, for example, GitHub, uh, once, you, uh, once a data scientist commits something on GitHub, uh, it triggers a workflow, uh, an algo workflow that gets submitted to Kubernetes and then it try, the workflow tries to do the in data ingestion based on whether the data has been uh, updated recently or not based on a cache store. And then it goes to the distributed training uh, through TensorFlow and Kubeflow uh, uh, training operator. And then Katip does the uh, parameter tuning and KServe handles the model serving um, at the end. So yeah, at the very last end, uh, so once you have the workflow, right, uh, the, 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 real, uh, the real life situation is that data scientists need to iterate uh, uh, this life cycle again and again. So this is something uh, they need to practice every day. So yeah, from modeling, uh, from data processing to modeling and everything in between, they have to iterate all the uh, different steps. So check out my, uh, my talk with Seven last year uh, to know more about the challenges uh, there. And last, and I'd like to advertise my book again. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. And yeah, yeah, you can read it free online. And uh, if you scan the QR code, you'll get a huge discount as well. So in case you want to get it now, here's the, uh, this is the time. <laughs> uh, that's it. Um, we have how many minutes? Two minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, uh, any questions? Uh, yes. One moment just to wait for the mic.
Thank you, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was really good. Um, uh, in the past, when we investigated Volcano, we didn't see uh, good interoperability with, um, um, uh, sorry, with uh, uh, Kubeflow, but uh, sorry, uh, Kubeflow training operator. But uh, maybe uh, so we will investigate that again. Uh, you also mentioned Ray. There is an operator, Cube Ray. Uh, is Volcano also having good interoperability, in your opinion, or? Uh, could you clarify what you mean by Volcano interoperability? Is it model interoperability or something else? Is it working fine together, in your opinion? Working fine together. Yeah, the scheduler of Volcano and Cube okay. Ray, uh, in this case. Yeah, I mean, if they are Kubernetes native, it should work well together. But uh, you will never know until you run them in production or you s when you start experimenting, right? So okay. you are. Uh, I'm, that's something you you need to know, like. Uh, when you actually uh, start working on it, actually, yeah. But okay. I, I know, like Ray, you need to start your own uh, a separate Ray cluster, right? Even though you have a Ray uh, uh, operator, it still needs uh, like some additional cluster set up. Uh, uh, instead of uh, unlike training operator, all you need is uh, the Kubernetes cluster. We'll try then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thanks. Thanks also for the talk. I think it was crazy uh, great. So m uh, maybe a question to uh, more to the algorithmic side. Uh, what do you think about the distributed uh, machine learning? Is there a trade-off? Do we reach the same performance, the same model performance as, as the non-distributed <coughs> version? That's a great question. So it's challenging to tune your distributed training, right? Especially when you are, when you are using parameter server uh, based uh, distributed training, you need to tune uh, the numbers uh, of parameter servers and the numbers of uh, the workers, right? That's the challenging part. So I find it uh, personally easy uh, to use the multi-worker strategy. Uh, if your model uh, can uh, can work that way, so that way you only have to add additional workers uh, instead of uh, introducing parameter servers. Yeah, so that takes uh, in short that takes time to 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 know the optimal numbers in between. So yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. One more. Maybe. Yeah, hi. Uh, regarding the Kubeflow, do you have plans to have um, two Airbag inside of uh, Kubeflow? Role-based role access or Airbag or whatever? Uh, could you repeat Airbag? Uh, some mo access model inside of Kubeflow itself because by default it's flat. There is no, like, you cannot uh, uh, give specific access roles to the, to the people. Yeah, user access control is definitely something we need to continue improving in Kubeflow. So if you have a, any specific suggestions, we'd like to take them uh, during the community meetings or like the, the work, one of the working group meetings. OK, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take, I guess I'll take more questions offline. And uh, Ross is here for answering questions for uh, regarding uh, model cars in Queso. And uh, also Andre is back there to answer any questions related to Kubeflow. Uh, yeah, thank you for listening.